Right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this session on modernizing India's agriculture. Um, we have a terrific panel um, here. Um, we have the uh, Chief Minister of Haryana, Mr. Bupinder Singh Huda. We've got the father of the Green Revolution in India and the chairman of the Swaminathan Research Foundation, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan. We've got Ashok Gulati, who's the director of Asia for the International Food Policy Research Institute. We've got Raj Jain, who's the president and CEO of Walmart. We've got Chengal Reddy, who's the co-chairman of the Indian Farmers and Industry Alliance. We've got Jerry Steiner, who's the executive vice president of the Monsanto Company. And we've got Robert Nemara Subaraman, who's a managing director and chief economist um, for Nomura in Hong Kong. So, for those of you in the room, you know, I just want to briefly sort of set the stage by giving you an introduction into India's agriculture sector. Um, you know, India's agricultural sector has very ancient roots. I mean, that goes back at least 10,000 years, uh, fed by um, two uh, monsoon cycles, um, f very fertile soil, and international trading networks. So it's, it's an old phenomenon, and today, it um, accounts for about 17% of India's GDP, uh, employs approximately 52% of the work workforce, according to the newest numbers. The uh, share of India's GDP, the percentage is steadily declining, but it remains the largest economic sector in terms of employment. So it, is, it plays a crucial role in uh, socioeconomic development. It ranks second in the world uh, uh, in terms of farm output, um, uh, and it is second in terms of arable land uh, next to the United States. And, you know, it's made some amazing achievements thanks to the Green Revolution and the White Revolution, and in terms of dairy, for instance, it has gone from being dairy deficient to being the largest dairy producer in the world. So, without further ado, I want to, the, the one request I'd make of both the sp uh, speakers as well as the as the audience, um, and you know <coughs> I want to make this as interactive as possible, is to keep your comments to a minimum because we have very limited time. So I'm going to invite uh, each of the speakers to speak for between uh, three and four minutes on the subject, um, and touch on specifically the issue of you know how how can you have new in investments, technologies, and policies to basically tackle an era of scarcity. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite the Chief Minister of Haryana to speak. And it's specifically, <coughs> sir, I'd also like you to address the issue of, you know, Haryana has made enormous progress in the last 10 to 20 years. Unfortunately, the numbers, if you look at the numbers, they, the growth is not as much in agriculture as it has been across other sectors. And what's more, the water table of Haryana is fast depleting. So if you could address those issues and also the larger issue, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my proud privilege to participate in India Economic Summit being organized by World Economic Forum and Confederation of Indian Industries. The organizers deserve appreciation for holding this summit to provide market-based solution to problems of the farmers. Agriculture continues to be the mainstay of Indian economy. Although it accounts for about 17% of national GDP, nation's GDP, it is the main source of livelihood for more than 60% of India's population. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in 1950 said, everything else can wait, but not agriculture. So as we all know, the Green Revolution boosted agriculture production across the country and accelerated the yield of major food grain crops, <coughs> mainly paddy and wheat in Haryana, Punjab, and western Uttar Pradesh. The country was transformed from a fo food deficient nation to a food sufficient nation. We achieved food grain production of 233.88 million tons during 2008 and 9. Growth in food grain product production of the country has either declined or stagnated during the current decade. Increase in food grain production is not keeping pace with the population growth. It is a cause of serious concern. To feed our ever-increasing population, the food grain production has to be doubled by 2040. 
with consistent 2.5 percent annual growth. Hence, there is need for a second green re revolution. It can be achieved only through dynamic approach, focus strategy, and application of new tools of science and technology. Degradation of soil health, fragmentation of land holdings, imbalanced use of fertilizers, inadequate availability of quality seeds, poor mechanization, depletion of water resources, knowledge gap, and poor dissemination of technology, etc., are mainly responsible for low productivity in agriculture. There is a wide gap between realized and realizable yield of various crops. The yield gap is, a, is as wide as 32% to 59% in case of wheat, 48% to 76% in rice, 65% to 83% in maize. The yield gap is particularly very wide in Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, and Uttar Pradesh. Hence, there is an urgent need to reduce the yield gap in various cro uh, crops across the country. Seed multiplication and dissemination through uh, appropriate training is the key to future success in achieving higher seed replacement rate. Seed village scheme should be implemented for accelerating the pace of quality seed productions. Treatment of certified seeds is a paramount importance to improve crop productivity. I would like to inform that Haryana has taken a major initiative in ensuring 100% seed treatment of certified seeds of wheat in the state from Rabi 2010 and 11. The entire cost towards treatment is being borne by the state government. Other states can also take similar steps. Balanced use of fertilizer is another important area which needs focused attention. Integrated <coughs> nutrient management needs to be increased involving judicious use of chemical fertilizers, biofertilizers, and locally available organic manure like farmyard manure, very compost, and green manure to maintain soil health and its productivity. It is also necessary to promote soil testing to assess the nutrient status, including testing of secondary and micronutrients. For this, the country needs adequate infrastructure for soil and water testing laboratories. Soil health cards are required to be issued to all the farmers to promote balanced use of fertilizer mobile. Mobile soil testing vans could be used to tap remote areas for control of pests and disease, integrated pest management approach emphasizing, emphasizing use of available pest control methods and techniques has to be popularized. IPM has to be priority now at national level through establishment of farmers field school. There is a good scope to promote organic farming in some parts of the country. Conventional practices are not suitable for growing crop originally, uh, organically. A specific technology package is required, which includes land preparation, selection of variety, organic fertilization, biological control of pests, <coughs> diseases, and weeds. Water management, as uh, we are telling, is, a, is an important issue to be tackled on priority. Various interventions like promotion of micro-irrigation, underground pipeline system, cultivation of drought-resistant <coughs> varieties of crops, and judicious use of available water needs to be promoted in a big way. The promotion of farm mechanization is very crucial, as this would reduce dependence on labor and improve input use efficiency. As a matter of fact, we need a technology mission on farm mechanization to overcome productivity barriers. Availability of credit to farmers is an important factor for agriculture growth. Easy availability of credit to farmers should be ensured. Further credit should be made available to farmers at not more than 4% per annum of interest. Minimum support price should be administered effectively and efficiently. 
as recommended by National Commission on Farmers, the MSP should be 50% higher than the actual cost of cultivation. The post-harvest losses of crop production are cause of concern. The official annual estimate of post-harvest crop losses is at rupees 55,000 crore, which is indeed alarming. A massive effort for building modern silos to arrest post-harvest lo losses of food grain is needed at national level. Immediate action is needed to build required infrastructure for storage through public and private sector investments. I would exhort the industry to come forward to supplement the efforts of government in this regard. Annual agriculture growth cannot be achieved without investing in agriculture research and development. Since mid-90s, private investment in agriculture has stagnated while public investment has continued to lead decline. A strong commitment is required on part of Government of India to improve the R&D scenario in agriculture. A national mission for sustainable agriculture as a part of national action plan on climate change should be set up to address the impact of climate change on agriculture sector. Research institutions should give focused attention on research and development to adapt to climate change with specific reference to erratic behavior of monsoons, temperature and weather <laughs> patterns observed in recent years. Industry can play an important role in funding the agriculture research institutions. <coughs> in fact, there should be a close linkage between farms, farm scientists and industrial and business houses for speedy technological innovation, in, in, innovations. As of now, the interaction between farm universities and industry is inadequate. The farm scientist industry collaboration will mutually benef beneficial through rapid integration of new, new knowledge, experience, and technology. Friends, I have shared with you some of my views on agriculture production. As you may be aware, Government of India has set up a working group on this important subject and I happen to head that working group. The Chief Minister of Punjab, Bihar, and West Bengal are members of the working group. All these aspects were discussed in detail in our meeting, and we have finalized our report. It will be submitted to the Prime Minister shortly. The most of issues are well known. Solutions are also in sight. By and large, what is required is determination and commitment to implement appropriate interventions. I am quite confident that this summit will go a long way in addressing the major challenges of farm sector. I once again compliment the organizers for holding such an important summit. I wish all success for summit. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chief Minister. <laughs> Professor Swaminathan, can I sort of frame this in frame the question to you and ask you to speak a little bit about the food security issue? I mean, we are going to see the population of India increasing. And uh, you know we've gone through this mode once before where there really was a food security threat. So can you sort of situate this within the, uh, within using that as sort of the uh, paradigm to think Thank about? Thank you. I think, <coughs> may I first of all uh, react uh, to the food security question in the context of modernization of agriculture? That's the theme. Uh, let me also make one general comment. If you say anything about India you, and you say the opposite of it, both will be true. The Haryana chief minister has made some comments. If you go to Orissa, there are, but there are underlying, there's a, some common problem. All over the country, majority are small farmers and their major concerns are three. One is the productivity should be improved so that market surplus, surplus of the market is there. Otherwise, your productivity doesn't. Profitability should improve, which a function of the prices, markets, and so on. And thirdly, how do you give the power and economy of scale to small producers? Management revolution, what I call the man small farm management revolution. So one is a management issue, the other is economics issue, the other third is ecological issue. Unless all these, if farm ecology and farm economics go wrong, nothing else will go right. And land is a shrinking resource. In his own state, land price is so high, there's a great temptation of people to quit farming and sell the land. You get one acre, one crore of rupees, and so on. So there are a number of problems. But coming to your food security issue, 
food security, we are now going in India from a purely a patronage to a rights approach. The last few years, the right to information, the right to education, the right to employment, the final list of those rights is the right to food, the right to food. Uh, yes, legislation is being developed, but uh, now you can't, you can't have a legal right to food uh, without producing enough uh, to feed our public distribution system. That is where the modernization and productivity comes. Uh, the National Advisory Council, headed by uh, Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, is now working on a broad draft which will go to government and then to parliament and so on. Essentially, it has four components. The very first component are legal entitlements. The legal entitlements will be based on a, on a life cycle approach, starting with the first thousand days, that is the child in the womb as well as two years more, and so on, from birth to death. It's a legal, legal entitlement on a, on a life cycle basis. Secondly, enabling provisions. Unless I, I can, uh, drinking water, sanitation, irrigation, and so on, the whole series of enabling factors. Thirdly, governance issues. How do you really deliver the, uh, the food to the people who are entitled? Fourthly, infrastructure issues, which are largely post-harvest technology. There's a strong mismatch between production and post-harvest technology, including storage, processing, value addition, and so on. So there are you know, enormous opportunities here for both technology and management, and above all, more investment will be needed in the farm sector. And uh, when the Food Security Bill of India comes, I think it will be the first of its kind in the world and will start a new process of food as a basic human right. Thank you. Um, Robert, can I come to you? Um, you know, most of this debate is actually going to be around India. So. Uh, can you situate the modernization of the Indian agricultural sector and sort of situate it in the sort of global macro context? Um, and, you know, what is your take on that? Sure. Um, well, I think as a starting point, um, th there's good reason to believe now that the, that the rise we've been seeing in, in global food prices is structural and is going to continue for several years. It's been driven by fundamental factors, whether it's the rapid growth of incomes in emerging markets or the changing diets of, of consumers in developing economies, water scarcity, as was mentioned, and also the tightening link between oil prices and food prices. Now, if you believe that this rise in global food prices is structural, I think it has um, uh, two very important implications f for India and, and globally. But particularly for India, I think one important implication at the macro level is CPI inflation. WPI inflation in India is among the highest in Asia, and one of the biggest reasons for that is food prices being so high. There's a lot of discussion about the Reserve Bank of India having to raise interest rates as a result, but if this is a structural rise in food prices, the real solution, the, the crux of it, and the real way to deal with it is to modernize agriculture and increase supply. So I think there is this uh, little bit of a disconnect between short term and long term. Short term, you might think you need to raise interest rates, but long term, to solve this inflation problem, involves fixing the supply side of agriculture. And then the second implication, I would say, as was mentioned at the beginning, um, if you think about India, we should be thinking big. Um, it's not just about bringing down inflation and improving rural living standards. The fact is that India is the second biggest farm producer in the world. It has the second largest amount of uh, arable land. Um, and yet, it, it's out of total world food exports, it makes up only 2%. So I think there's enormous scope for India to become a food factory for the world going forward, a huge opportunity for India. So what I would like, and for the audience and also my, my fellow panelists to discuss going forward, is how can we partner business with farmers going forward? We have a fragmented farms in India, which is a, a structural issue, but can we think about ways to get corporates more involved with farmers, partnerish, partnering, contract farming, and so forth? Because uh, f as uh, working for Namura and seeing clients around the world, I think financial institutions since this global financial crisis, are very keen to diversify their investments and want to invest more in, in agriculture. And it's just a matter of, of finding ways for them to channel that investment. Thanks. Um, 
and you know, there's several people on the panel who can address that particular issue of the collaboration. But before I go there, Ashok, can I bring you into the conversation? Let's, let's go back to the initial um, uh, you know, statistics that we were talking about, which is you know, the rest of the Indian economy is growing furiously and agriculture is lagging behind. So simply put, what ails India's agricultural sector? And if you can also specifically touch on the distortionary effects of subsidies in this country, that'd be great. Well, as everyone knows, uh, overall growth, eight to nine percent, very resounding success of India in the global arena. But still, poverty is not declining at a rate at which we would like to. Malnutrition is not declining at a rate at which we would like to. And I think the crux of that entire problem, to a large extent, lies in because we are not able to get the growth rates in agriculture to the promised targeted growth rates of 4% plus. We are getting at 2.5%, less than 3%, and that too with large volatility. The last 25 years of global research on development processes has revealed that one percentage growth in agriculture is at least two to three times more effective in reducing poverty than the same growth coming from non-agriculture sector. World Development Report of 2008, it reviews the development experience of the world over the last 25 years, and this is the conclusion. If we do not understand that, if you look at China, which fired the whole reform process from agriculture, and then they went to industry, and now they're going to services, we have started the growth process from the services side, entering, agri uh, entering uh, manufacturing, and agriculture is still waiting for reforms. So what ails Indian agriculture? First, the policy paradigm at present is not geared towards agriculture. Second, you need to invest to rev up your agriculture. 80% of the resources going to agriculture are going through subsidies, free power, cheap uh, fertilizer, cheap uh, water, which is damaging the environment, which is uh, not leading to efficient use of many of those resources, and only 20% of the resources go through investments. The marginal rates of return on a billion dollar going through investment versus going through subsidies the ratio is one is to 10, one is to eight. Rural roads give you eight times, nine times more return than uh, free power, for example. So this is first major problem that the resource allocation, 20% should be subsidy, 80% should be investment, it's the other way around. Second, why should the private sector come and invest? It needs incentives to invest. When you look at the incentive structure within Indian agriculture, and Indian agriculture, by the way, we should forget just talking about farming. It is the entire value chain from farm to folk. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would put it the other way around. In a liberalized economy, it's the demand pull that is plate to plow. You look at first how the thali is changing, how the complexion of consumption is changing, how the retail is changing, how the processing is changing, how the logistics have to change, and then go to the farm. Otherwise, if it is a supply push, which was the 1960s late and the 70s when there was a huge shortage, that's not the story today. You need to align your supply structures to what the demand, emerging demand is, and therefore go by the consumption pattern. Now we look at that the incentive structures, particularly in the grain sector, are heavily loaded with government intervention. Late 60s, early 70s, government led the way and created a revolution. You look at the white revolution, it was cooperative led, supported by the government. You look at the last 10 years, the, any revolution in Indian agriculture is coming from two crops, cotton and hybrid maize. Cotton production doubled in six years, BT cotton, we may agree, we may disagree, but the fact is, it is both these revolutions are driven largely by the private sector. We should read that. This is written on the wall that the investments, whether it is by multinationals or others, Monsanto alone puts in more than a billion dollar in R&D. The whole of CG system, what we call the Consultative Group of International Agriculture Research from where I come from, 
the together is five to six hundred mil million dollars. So know where those investments are taking place. But then the question is, private sector, when it comes up with new technologies and new revolutions, how much it shares with the rest of the society, especially the bottom, 30%. And that's a challenge, how to make it inclusive rather than just growth oriented, how to make the entire process inclusive. And that is where innovations are needed in Indian agriculture. I'll leave it at that. Excellent. Thank you. So that's a great segue to bring in Jerry into this conversation. Jerry, I mean, clearly productivity needs to go up and technology is going to play a large part in that. But you also have this issue that Ashok just raised at the very bottom, which is how do you ensure that technology benefits the vast numbers of people out there rather than just a small number? So, you know, from speaking from either a Monsanto perspective or a technology perspective, um, do you want to come in on this? Sure. Mm. Let me first speak on behalf of, there are 17 companies uh, that have participated in a new vision for agriculture as part of the World Economic Forum. We've been working on this along with knowledge partners and co consultation with uh, a number of governments on trying to plot this roadmap for what it's going to take to meet the overall challenge of the near doubling of food production by 2050. More rapidly here, we talked about 2040 here in India, and it would even be more rapid in a number of other countries around the world. Do it in an environmentally sustainable manner. You've heard water being talked about. Uh, here we obviously don't have twice as much water to produce twice as much food. And have it be a source of, of inclusive growth uh, and, and getting to the bottom. And I won't try to summarize um, a 50-page roadmap in, in two minutes, but I'll just go through kind of two beliefs that we all come through with this. One is that the only solution which we believe is sustainable is to create and maintain competitive marketplaces. Um, and, and there are some places where we're there, there are other places we have to work at it. The second is that we all have to come at this from a mindset that this vision is very farmer-centric. The farmer, which often is a she, is the main actor in this equation and we have to treat that person like an entrepreneurial business person that they very are. I think way too often we underestimate uh, what the farmer is capable. There clearly are places where there is an information gap, and I think that's part of this collaboration that we have to get to. Competitive markets provide um, the incentive for all of our 17 companies and a whole lot more to make the investments to be part of that solution, but it takes the right kind of thoughtful, and I, I suspect sometimes unpopular, public policy to create that set of incentives for the private investment, and I think the public investment, because it's taxpayer money, um, to create the kind of innovation that it's going to take to meet this enormous challenge um, that is out there. You know, we're, let me speak for a, a, a second about our company. We are putting a, about a billion dollars a year on the line. Uh, in research and development, and I think that the thing about agriculture is you can't hop in and hop out. You need to sustain it because all of these products take a decade from the time that you discover them to the time that they, they first get into field uh, and, and can actually make a difference. So the first aspect of, uh, of this is we have to have the incentives that allow people to make those investments and earn a return from it. And the pieces of public policy that really matter there, you know, the, the, the first piece on the inclusive part I would offer is farmers have to have access to these technologies, and I'm specifically talking about biotechnology, which is, which is regulated, and having a science-based regulatory system that is predictable is really important to people that are investing, especially the smaller companies here in India that are emerging. It's also really important to farmers so that they have access to it. Let me talk about collaboration, because that's the other piece of it. Um, um, we, as companies also, I think, have a responsibility to think business as unusual. I know in our, our company here in India, as an example, I'm sure there are lots of other ones, we've got six partnerships with state governments where we work with those states in a model that is commercial. It's subsidized and graduated over a number of years, and, and the belief is that we can work with these and help transfer some knowledge on how to give them a new choice. And that new choice is really an old choice. It's simply hybrid seed technology that's been available for 60, 70, 80 years in a bunch of places. And uh, look at the right agronomic practices to help them move from, um, 
four quintals an acre, I know it's a mixed metric, that's what I heard here, uh, to 1.2 or 1.3, and it, make, it makes an incredible difference, a doubling of tripling of, of income. And I think we've, we as the, the private sector have to be more courageous about taking these on and taking them on in some scale. We're now in with six of them reaching a million farmers here in India. So both innovation um, and, and collaboration, I think, are going to be really important pieces of it. We talked about BT cotton. I, I think it is a fabulous example, and I'll call it the other white revolution here in India. It, it, what's happened is total cotton production has doubled. That's happened at a farmer level. Um, most importantly, perhaps, to the farmers that I talked to, their income has doubled, and the income gain hasn't stopped with the farmer. It's also transferred also to the farm laborer, who now gets paid per kilogram to pick the cotton and can pick more cotton in a day than they could before, and it goes downstream to the sector. So I believe we need policy that encourages more BT cottons. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Reddy, one of the key issues that came up just now, well, I mean, a couple of issues. One is, you know, there is this tendency of the uh, elite, if you will, to treat the farmer as something, you know, as not as an entrepreneur, but a, as anything but an entrepreneur and as somebody who needs to be protected, et cetera, et cetera. But also, if you could touch on um, farmers' access to markets, and perhaps you are probably the best person to talk about the cooperation and the collaborative models that can emerge potentially between farmers and corporations and industry. See, it's obvious that in the last, since 1990, when the Indian industry and service sector has become globally competitive, it didn't do it by itself. Let's be very clear about it. There were the best technologies, be it IT technology, chemical technology, automobile technology. You have all partners. Not only partnership in technology, but investments. That's why you became globally competitive. It's not that you brought it somewhere from Mumbai or Delhi or from Punjab or Haryana. No. Even earlier, look at the great technological revolution of uh, our first green revolution. It's all technologies, whether it's seed or pesticides or something. The challenge today for agriculture sector is very simple. First is we have realized that government has limitations and that they are withdrawing. It's good. Nothing wrong in that. We have seen in India our education system our health system are one of the best in the world, and sought after even by Canadians and Americans. That's because in these two sectors, we have the best technologies and investments. Now, my, challenge, my question to our firm and ourselves is, why not we develop partnership with industry? What's wrong in that? Who says that industry alone is exploiter? It's nothing like exploitation by industry, politicians, or bureaucrats. Every system has its own inherent limitations and defects and variations. So what I suggest is it is possible by partnership to make Indian agriculture highly competitive. The best example is our next door neighbor, China. Look at China, small farmers, less than our India, and their own climatic condition is 50% is not only that of India. They have only 50% days good, whereas we have 360 days, and we have excellent agroclimatic advantages and a knowledgeable farmers of over three, 4,000 years. But what is lacking is that we are very evident that government has come to limitations. For example, our agriculture extension, processing, marketing. In fact, the very investment itself, we have our own banks are able to hardly cover 30 to 40%. It is here I would say that there is a need for certain immediate actions by government which needs to be taken forward both by industry and farmers. Some of them are three, four main issues related to the market reforms, which our own state government of India said about six, seven years back they brought in APMC, some sort of a accessing anybody can access. But then how many states have implemented and why they are not implemented, a question that requires to be changed into. Our own land loss that belongs to requires to be modified. Our own administrative systems requires to be modified. And then the question ultimately is the farmer's empowerment. We need to be consulted. We need to be insulted. I mean, involved in planning and preparation. Don't treat us as if we are naive. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you how many of you know that there is no culture in agriculture. Do you know that? Indian agriculture is not a culture any longer. Indian agriculture is an enterprise. It's a business. I don't know how many of you CEOs and experts know about that. But I, as a farmer's activist, say that India is agriculture is an entrepreneur activity. That is how to come. And lastly, what I would appeal to the industry, whether it is MNC or Indian, is 
you should learn to work with farmers as a partners. Are you willing to sit with them across the table? You better do that. Because it is, it's not difficult even for the small farmers to be brought together. So there is a wonderful concept across the country called Atma. It's where producer groups are being brought together. Every state is implementing. There's a planning commission, government of India programs. Any MNC can involve it and can be done it. So my key word is getting access to technologies and investment through partnership. I would say that should be the future for the, uh, the forum or others to take it forward. Raj, <clears throat> you know, I think most people are well aware of the logistical challenges with, in the Indian agriculture sector, and perhaps you can sort of walk us through both the back-end challenges as well as the front-end challenges, you know, whether that be logistics, marketing, et cetera. Sure, I just want to start with, uh, uh, you know, the Honorable Minister talked about the yield gap in, in, in farming today. And I just want to add about, uh, one more dimension to it, which is the price value gap. And, uh, you know, there are lots of reports being written about how much wastage takes place post-harvest. Uh, you know, those numbers may be wrong by 5, 10, 20 percent, whatever, but there is still a significant amount uh, of, of wastage which happens in uh, post-agriculture from the field. And uh, <clears throat> not much is being done about it, not much investment is being made about it. Um, uh, in it, and I think one of the biggest reasons and dimensions I want to throw at this stage is, uh, you know, I think it lacks a consumer focus, because everything, like every industry which develops, you have to start with the customer and the, uh, the consumer. Uh, one of the questions normally asked is, why are we not investing enough in food processing? There are so many tax incentives. Um, I mean, the question to ask is, is the Indian consumer even ready to consume processed foods? Uh, maybe the answer is no. Maybe the answer is something which we don't know about and we need to first figure that out. And then for companies to invest in that research and understanding and then bring it back through the chain into food processing and into farming, which will require special varieties to be developed, which will then be good for food processing and then keep, uh, be put on the, on the table. So uh, there is a huge issue in understanding the customer and what is required as a product and then what it means to farming. Uh, and there is no investment going into that largely because, uh, you know, the, the incentive structures, uh, the APFC Act, you know, we just talked about, in many cases even bars companies from directly sourcing from farmers, let alone, uh, you know, doing all kinds of contract and other types of farming. Uh, and plus, you know, access to consumer side on retail, et cetera, doesn't allow a lot of at least multinationals to be able to talk to the customers and make those investments. So those are some of the big issues and uh, for, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that in the short to medium term, for sure, I think if we were to just manage that aspect of our uh, agriculture policy, I think we could see a lot of equity in farming. Long term, we need to, of course, focus on sustainable farming, the issues we all talked about, about yield, technology, water, and resources. So would it be fair to say then that, this, your, for instance, your inability to um, directly access produce from the farmer drives up cost to consumers, drives down price for producer. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, there's a tax, an APMC tax you have to pay. In some states, they've allowed us to go and, uh, you know, directly source from the farmers. You still have to pay the tax. Uh, and what, go, uh, what happens to that tax? I, do, I don't know whether it gets invested or doesn't get invested, gets lost in the system. I mean, my plea would be a very simple thing, you know, let that tax be collected and let the private company who's uh, procuring from the uh, farmers show that they have reinvested that in the farm. You know, it's possible to do that very transparently, but the government would not allow that. So it's a, it's a simple example, but it's an important example. Sure. I mean, just to touch on the food processing bit, I mean, a recent McKinsey study showed that there was an opportunity, there was a $60 billion opportunity in the Indian food processing sector alone, and it could employ a substantial chunk of the Indian agricultural workforce. Uh, Mr. Chief Minister, would you like to respond to any of the points that have been raised? has spoken, basic issue in India is that, the, uh, the, that India is a con uh, country for both producer as well as consumer. So that balance has to be kept because uh, that, that as uh, my friend was saying you know, about subsidy also. Subsidy, uh, what, what is happening in USA? Farmers, that uh, agriculture is pro profiting, pro profit making um, uh, 
uh, thing. But in India, still, farming is not a profit making. So, uh, to sustain farmer and to for sustain for agriculture production, we have to keep uh, uh, b balance. You see, uh, supposing water, uh, you, as you were talking, the basic problem uh, of water, this has to be tackled. If you go to Israel, you can see. So that way, uh, proper use of every drop of water, uh, actually in, in, the, in future, the real say, the problem would be water. It is not in India only, everywhere. It, uh, you are talking about Haryana, Punjab, that is not their case. It is everywhere. Depletion is there everywhere. So these uh, issues are to be tackled and balance has to be uh, t taken. Subsidy, we can't forego unless it we, how to make uh, agriculture prof uh, pro uh, profitable business? Unless agriculture is a profitable business, industry would also come forward. But R&D, yes, we have got potential. Uh, supposing there are gaps, that has to be covered. And by 2040, our agriculture production has to be doubled unless it won't match with the increase of population. So there's uh, new strategies have to be formed for that whether it is in fertilizer, for whether it is seed industry or fertilizer industry, the use of fertilizers and the technological uh, help uh, which the industry can give. Of course, the industry has earned. What, what, what about tractor, small tractors? There are so, so, so many implements. There's a lot of scope for industry also. So that we have to coordinate. And actually, there's gap. There's no proper coordination between agriculture universities and industry and business. So that. That has to be taken into care. If, if there is proper coordination between uh, for farm universities, uh, industry, and business, then we can make uh, see our achieve our target. And far, uh, farming, farmer, as, as a farmer, I can say, because I am son of a farmer, farming is still not uh, profit making in India. So how to uh, make uh, people be? Of course, 60% of the population that depends upon agriculture. GDP may be very low, maybe 17%, but still 60% of um, uh, jobs are being provided by the agriculture. So we in, in India, we cannot ignore it. There, there are countries which are producers, there may not be any consumers. But I don't agree with him that about food, processed food, uh, they are not, uh, if they're food processing is an um, item which has to be uh, and you see, increased, and uh, they 